And so if I do this from year 1000 AD to close to the present, you see if carbon-14 dating is correct, the data should fall on this line. They don't exactly do that. In fact, they vary by as much as 70%, and that's only over the last 1,000 th years. We can actually go back to about 3,000 years if we use the right kind of tree rings and so forth. So we can extend this back to 3,000 years of hope, but that's it. And over that period, carbon-14 concentrations in the atmosphere have changed pretty dramatically. Now, interestingly enough, once you have this graph, you can use it as a calibration. So I know that at this state, I know there was this much carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So once I have this calibration, I can use carbon-14 dating. And as long as the radioactive decay rate has been constant over the last few thousand years, it's a fairly accurate tool. But it's only accurate because we have this calibration. Once we lose this calibration, once we go past 3,000 years ago, we have to assume this flat line, which we absolutely know is not correct. So carbon-14 dating is a very good tool for archaeology, assuming the decay rates have been constant for the last few thousand years. But for long-term discussions, it doesn't work because we lose our calibration and our calibration tells us the initial assumption is wrong. Real quickly, there's a bigger problem with carbon-14 dating. Turns out there's an enormous amount of stuff, and this has only really been popularized in the last few years, uh, that uh, the carbon-14 dating indicates that the item is very, very young but the standard geology indicates the item is very, very old. Ten coal samples from all over the U.S. that are supposed to be somewhere between 45 to 330 million years old dated about 50,000 years old by the carbon-14 dating system. Diamond. Almost so hard to understand how you could contaminate diamond. Diamond samples from five different mines in Botswana and South Africa supposed to be several hundred million years old. By carbon-14, they all roughly date at 57,000 years old. That's a problem. In fact, if you go to the, to the website, get the notes, uh, I link you to a study that lists 90 other cases of this happening in the literature. 90 other cases where things that are supposed to be millions of years old end up being dated as only tens of thousands of years old by carbon-14. That's a real issue. Finally, how do we get these old ages of the Earth? How do, why do we, people believe the Earth is 4.6 billion years old? They use other radiometric dating processes that use slower uh, uh, radioactive decay. One of the most popular ones to use is a potassium argon dating method. It says um, argon 40 or uh, potassium 40 slowly decays into argon 40 over time. Argon's a gas. So let's suppose you have a, a volcano spewing lava out. That lava is very, very hot, right? Gases. Their solubility in liquids goes down significantly with increasing temperature. So the argument is, is while the lava is hot, all the argon-40 boils out of it. So when the lava rock freezes, hardens, it should have no argon-40 in it because everything boiled out. In the end then, these rocks start with no argon-40. Any argon-40 that comes in ought to be the result of uh, radioactive decay. Since we know the rate, we can therefore measure how old the rock is. Once again, there's a real problem. Whenever we happen to know the date of the lava flow, the potassium argon dating method is wrong. For example, here's a Hawaiian lava flow. Rocks that were formed from this Hawaiian lava flow, history records it to have occurred 200 years ago, were dated at 1.6 plus or minus 0.16 million years old. 500 year old lava flow, once again dated by history, dated as 12.6 million years old. Another Hawaiian one, history tells us these rocks are 200 years old. They're dated as almost 50 million years old. Uh, Snelling has 23 other examples like this, so it's not just one or two examples. This is a serious problem because what it tells you is, in each one of these cases, we know how old the lava is. It's very young. It tells us that this assumption is wrong. There must be argon-40 when that lava freezes, or there'd be no way to get these kind of dates uh, out of these very young rocks. So in the end, what can we conclude from this? Well, if we go back to what seems like three hours ago, right? Um, salt in the ocean leads us to a maximum age of 62 million years for the Earth. Helium in the atmosphere, a maximum age of 2 million years. Dendrochronology just doesn't give us a date, but indicates the most likely years uh, is, is several thousands to tens of thousands. Otherwise, you ought to have older trees. The only successful model of planetary magnetic fields gives us a maximum age of 9,000 years. Lack of short-lived radioisotopes 
indicates a minimum age of several hundred million years, but this depends on an assumption. Radiometric dating seems to not be reliable except in the specific case of carbon-14 over the past 3,000 years because we have a calibration for it. So you can see what I said at the beginning. <laughs> These dates seem to be all over the charts, right? Hundreds of millions of years, 9,000 years, 2 million years, 62 million years. In the end, I think you're most consistent with the majority of the data if you sit right around here. If you sit right around 10,000, 9,000 years old for the age of the Earth. That gives me the least amount of data that's a problem and the most amount of data that I can understand. And as a scientist, that's what I look for. So that's where I am right now on the age of the Earth. Who knows? New science might cause a new conclusion. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll let you control all that and then stop okay. when you're done. So, yes, yeah, sir. Does the fact that oil is still under pressure under the Earth's crust, is that an indi indicator that we're a young Earth as well? Is the fact that oil under pressure, uh, under pressure in the Earth uh, indicate the Earth is young? Probably not. Um, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of controversy right now, even in uh, the, uh, um, um, the standard, let's say, uh, uh, scientific literature about how oil is made. We used to think oil is just dead dinosaurs. Uh, now it's not clear that's the case. There's some uh, incredible research coming out of both Russia and France where they're actually simulating conditions in the mantle and they're making hydrocarbon mixtures. And in fact, they're making better hydrocarb hydrocarbon mixtures using these uh, mantle conditions than we can with rotting vegetation. And generally, rotting vegetation produces only the short change, like methane, ethane, uh, propane. Uh, the uh, mantle is actually producing things like octane, uh, which is what you expect for a petroleum mixture. So if I would agree that if oil really is dead dinosaurs, the fact that it's under high pressure still is probably a problem. But I'm not sure that oil, we know coal almost certainly is uh, organic, but it's not clear anymore that, uh, that oil really is organic. And I'm, you know, that's not uh, creation or evolution, that's just what's in the geochemical literature right now. Some very interesting stuff going on there. Yes, sir? Well, how long does it take coal to form? Part of that depends on your, uh, on your, uh, on your uh, um, conditions. For example, in the laboratory, I can form coal in about a week, right? Given the right catalysts and, and, and the right pressure conditions and so forth. Um, there's some indication that at least some of the coal deposited on the earth formed rather quickly because it seems to trap uh, fossils across strata. These polystratic fossils, it's hard to understand how the coal formed in a very slow time and continue and let that polystratic fossil, you know, one layer of coal forms over a couple million years, the next layer of coal forms over a couple million years, and throughout that whole time, that fossil was <laughs> just sort of sticking up, you know, until the next layer of coal formed. Uh, so there, there's some indication at least that at least some of the coal uh, on, uh, deposit on the earth forms quickly. But the real question is, what's the conditions? You know, I can form coal quickly, given the right kind of catalysts and so forth. If I have those catalysts in nature, I can form coal quickly in nature, too. So, yes, sir. I was told that uh, this event is being sponsored by the um, Campus Crusade for Christ. Yes. Okay. My second question would be now, what, what, does, what do Christians, why do they want this, this theory of the earth being young? Why, why is that applicable for them? Well, some Christians want the age of the earth to be young because they really think that the, that the book of Genesis says that God created the earth in six 24-hour days, and then there was Adam, and we know how old Adam was, we can count generations, and we can come up with an age of only a few thousand years. Uh, a lot of Christians believe that that's pretty sacrosanct. They have to believe that. I personally don't. You know, I think there's been a lot of, there's been a minority view in Christianity, actually in Judaism prior to Christianity, that the, those days aren't 24-hour days, that they represent long eons of time. There's a minority view, but it's always been there. So I'm not sure the scriptures really say that. But if they do, that's why, you know, so, some Christians believe that, and that's why they want a young earth. I would be comfortable theologically with an old earth. I'm just not comfortable with it scientifically. I'll get you if there's nobody else. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Do you, do you uh, agree with Dr. Stephen Austin's view of how coal formed with the big floating rock man? Do I, yeah, do I agree? Uh, Steve Austin uh, from the Institute for Creation Research has a, a, a detailed theory of coal formation in which uh, global worldwide flood produced these floating mats of vegetation. And these floating 